Thank you all for joining us for this timely event. Good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are watching from other parts of the world. My name is Suzanne Maloney and I'm the Vice President of the Brookings Institution and Director of our Foreign Policy Program. I've spent my career working on the Middle East, including at Brookings Center for Middle East Policy. And so I'm especially delighted to introduce today's event on US policy toward the region. Joining us today is Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, David Schenker. In this role, he is the most senior American diplomat focused solely on the Middle East and North Africa. Prior to joining the State Department, Assistant Secretary Schenker was Director of the Program on Arab Politics at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He also served as Levant Country Director in the Office of Secretary of Defense, He's the author of multiple books and many studies on Iraqi, Jordanian, Palestinian, and Egyptian affairs. And he's a highly respected member of the policy community here in Washington. We're really fortunate to have Assistant Secretary Schenker join us in this very timely moment as he's just returned from a mission to the Middle East where he visited Kuwait, Qatar, and Lebanon. Assistant Secretary Schenker, David, thank you for being with us this morning. I'm also happy to introduce Nesman Sachs, the director of our Center for Middle East Policy, who will moderate this morning's conversation. Natan is our foremost expert on Israeli politics, but we'll be speaking about a wide range of topics this morning. For nearly 20 years, the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings has brought together some of the most influential experts from and on the region. We are committed to understanding and addressing the Middle East political, economics, and social trajectories. Today's event is part of a large body of work done by the Center from publishing books, reports, and op-eds to private and public convenings such as this one. Before I turn the mic over to Assistant Secretary Schenker for his remarks, I'd like to convey our gratitude to the Diane and Guilford Glazer Philanthropies for their support of our ongoing work, which allows us to host today's event. With that, let me turn the virtual floor over to Natan. Suzanne, thank you very much. And another thank you to you, Assistant Secretary Schenker. Just a couple of points of order. Uh, our event is of course on the record. It's being uh, webcast live. We will also have a recording of this event on our website, the same website. After Assistant Secretary Schenker uh, speaks, we will take questions and I'll collate them and uh, hand them over to uh, the Assistant Secretary virtually. You can submit your questions either on Twitter at hashtag US Foreign Policy or emailing events at brookings.edu. So without further ado, and with thanks, Assistant Secretary Schenker. So thank you, uh, Natan. Thank you, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to, to be at Brookings today. And um, uh, I've spent a lot of time there as a think tanker, um, visiting and conferring with, with colleagues and counterparts. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you today to talk a little bit about uh, my recent trip to the region. Um, and also to, to give you a little bit of a readout of the, the secretary's trip. Uh, he traveled a, about a week before I did, um, or a matter of days before I did. Um, but I'd like to start first with, uh, with an update on the, the Abraham Accords. Um, as you know, we successfully brokered um, an agreement to normalize relations between the Emirates and Israel. Uh, the first agreement uh, of its kind since 1994, uh, the, the first peace between uh, or normalization, a uh, significant step toward that in, in over 25 years. Um, the, con the countries have committed to exchange of ambassadors, uh, embassies, uh, to begin cooperation on a broad range of fields, including education, healthcare, uh, trade, and security. Uh, we've already seen some significant steps moving to implement the records. The phone lines are up between the UAE and Israel. Uh, this is followed by direct calls between Israeli foreign ministers and defense ministers. Uh, the Israelis and the Emiratis have already started to collaborate on research. We hope will will lead to a breakthrough on COVID nineteen. Um, significantly, two uh, two weeks ago, the UAE formally abolished a forty year boycott law, allowing uh, Emirati companies and individuals to to freely trade directly with Israel. Uh, it's a monumental move, I think, by by any standard, and we believe that it will undoubtedly set off a cascade of uh, of regional developments. Uh, finally, we saw the, the first commercial flight uh, of El Al to UAE uh, carrying both Israeli officials and, and the media. Uh, during the trip, they talked about bilateral cooperation in uh, key areas, uh, investment, finance, health, 
civilian space program, civil aviation, foreign policy, and diplomatic affairs, tourism, and culture. Uh, the result is going to be, uh, I think, a broad uh, cooperation between the two, uh, between two of the regions that really most advanced technologically uh, and innovative and dynamic economies. So we hope to see uh, a direct Etihad flight from the UAE to Israel soon. Uh, we've already, of course, had that in the form of, uh, of aid to the Palestinians, but um, this is something, something different. Um, beyond the immediate changes to the Emirati relationship with Israel and the impact, we believe the impact will be felt more broadly in the region, uh, uh, much as what happened in, in, uh, in Egypt uh, in the Camp David Accords really set the stage for Wadi Arava. Um, we believe that uh, what happened um, with the Abraham Accords uh, will change the regional dynamics. I'm not going to predict uh, dominoes falling in the region, um, but I, I think it sets a, a different regional tone that will enable other state, states to enhance the relationship with uh, Israel, with quiet relations or, or to start new relations, um, have more normal relations. So um, we build trust with our regional allies and reorient, reoriented their re strategic calculus by identifying shared interests and common opportunities. And we've help move them away uh, from old conflicts. Um, uh, we believe that the agreement puts the region on a truly transformative path towards stability, security, and more opportunity. Uh, these expanded, especially the expanded business and financial ties will accelerate growth and economic opportunity uh, throughout the, the region. Um, once again, we, we hope that this move toward normalization not only will uh, result in other states taking steps toward, um, toward normalization, but that it will also encourage the Palestinians to re-engage with Israel and or the United States on, on other issues. Um, as for the secretary, um, he, he recently visited uh, Israel, Bahrain, the UAE, Oman, and Sudan. Um, the focus was to follow up on the initial agreement of, of the Abraham Accords and discuss other bilateral issues. Um, in Israel, he met with uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, alternate Prime Minister Gans, and Foreign Minister Ashkenazi, um, with whom he discussed key portions of the agreement. Um, he also discussed uh, with Israel uh, our ongoing concerns uh, about China. Uh, when I accompanied the Secretary earlier this year in May uh, to Israel, uh, we delivered some straightforward messages on the risks that Chinese investment could pose toward Israel. Um, Israel listened to that message and, and took action, um, including the, the announcement of an investment review mechanism. So we, we want to see that work continue um, and, um, and grow stronger. Um, we are not asking uh, states in the region, because this is not a message solely delivered to Israel. It's a frequent message we deliver throughout the region to our partners, but uh, we're not asking states to choose. We're asking them uh, to, um, to have an understanding of what this investment need, means um, for their economies, for their security, for our strategic relationship. Um, in addition, uh, the Secretary addressed continued threat posed by Iran and Israel, among many uh, of our regional partners, share these concerns about Iran's malign regional activities. Um, in the Gulf, the Secretary made the case for Gulf unity in the, in the face of shared concern about Iran. Uh, in Bahrain, the Secretary met with uh, King Hamad uh, and Crown Prince uh, Salman al-Khalifa. Uh, in addition to uh, encouraging support for the Abraham Accords, uh, they discussed the need to um, work toward um, <laughs> ending the Gulf Rift, um, which will better enable us to counter uh, the Iranian regime's malign activities. Uh, in Oman, the, the Secretary congratulated the Sultan on his new Council of Ministers, our, our cabinet equivalent, um, Secretary is also the first visiting foreign dignitary to congratulate the new foreign minister in person on the appointment. Uh, in UAE, the Secretary met with uh, Foreign Minister um, ABZ and uh, National Security Advisor Sheikh Tanun to congratulate the Emiratis on, on the achievement of the Accords and to follow up uh, activities for implementing these Accords. Uh, the Secretary also stopped in Sudan. Um, that is beyond my AOR, um, fortunately enough, but um, I will say it was a the first direct flight between uh, between Sudan and Israel, um, and uh, for the United States government, the success of Suzan um, Sudan's transition has uh, important implications for the region that I cover. 
uh, and the Secretary's meetings of the transitional government were an important step toward ensuring regional stability. As for my trip, um, following the Secretary's visit, I spent a, a week in the region, uh, just returning on, on Friday. Uh, my first stop was in Kuwait. I uh, visited to reassure a longstanding partner that we value the sustained close cooperation. Um, and that cooperation is, um, is outstanding. Um, you know, we have uh, some 14,000 troops in Kuwait. Um, we have nearly 100,000 troops that rotate through, uh, through Kuwait a year. Um, excellent economic cooperation, a broad range of, of cooperation uh, and trade with the Kuwaitis. Um, so I previewed our plans for our upcoming strategic dialogue, uh, and I thank the Kuwaitis for their ongoing and very important central role in uh, actually trying to mediate an end to the Gulf Rift. In Qatar, I, I also talked uh, about our uh, work to preview our strategic dialogue, which is coming up on the, the 14th and the 15th. Um, uh, I talked about what the Rift was doing around the region, um, but I also congratulated uh, the Qataris on uh, their, their new labor law, uh, which will upend the kafala system. Um, it's uh, quite a remarkable development. Um, through it all, um, the Abraham Accords, you know, you can tell it's reverberating in the region. Um, but as I told the Kuwaitis, um, you know, the United States respects the sovereignty of uh, the states in the region and the states in the Gulf. Uh, you know, it's our hope. Uh, that uh, others will follow the example of the UAE, um, but these are sovereign states and they were gonna make their own, their own choices. Um, in Lebanon, um, I carried a message to the Lebanese people uh, that were committed to helping them recover from the, the you know, horrific uh, August 4th explosion. We provided more than $18 million in humanitarian assistance on that front so far um, and are uh, preparing to, um, to provide an additional 30 million to support efforts to recover from this disaster. Um, but I also talked with uh, the Lebanese um, about um, our support for them in their efforts to end the corruption and mismanagement and stress the need uh, for um, their government or whatever government comes next uh, to implement the necessary reforms uh, to bring Lebanon back from this devastating economic crisis, also to commit to a, a policy of disassociation. Uh, we watched closely as uh, Lebanon's uh, economy has deteriorated um, and the government has really failed its people, choosing to protect narrow, um, sometimes sectarian interests and patterns of corruption instead of making um, difficult decisions uh, needed to provide uh, for the Lebanese people. Um, yesterday, you might have seen that OFAC announced new sanctions against Yusuf Fenenos and Ali Hassan Khalil, both former ministers uh, associated with Hezbollah and corruption. Uh, both conspired with Hezbollah for personal and political benefit at the expense of the Lebanese people and institutions. Um, our assistance in response to August 4th um, underpins two decades of bilateral assistance to Lebanese people totaling nearly $5 billion. Um, since the onset of the pandemic, the United States has provided $41 million plus to the Lebanese people um, in emergency COVID assistance. Um, just the figures are, are enormous. We're the largest donor to Lebanon last year, 2019, we provided $750 million to Lebanon. Um, in Lebanon, we also talked about um, uh, Syrian refugees and, and our humanitarian support um, for them in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon hosts the second largest number of refugees uh, per capita, an important role that the, the international community has to continue to support. Uh, finally, um, I discussed UNIFIL. Um, this is a, an issue that we've worked a great deal on um, over the past year. Um, in the mandate renewal, we pressed hard for changes to the mandate of seeking greater, greater accountability uh, and access. Um, uh, and uh, the ability to, to right-size the force structure so that it matches what UNIFIL is actually uh, carrying out on the ground. Um, we want a successful UNIFIL. Uh, it can play a strong role in helping Lebanon and ensuring regional security. But that can only happen uh, if UNIFIL is unimpeded to address violations by Hezbollah. Um, I think we, we made unprecedented progress uh, in our effort to fix the mandate. 
Um, we didn't get all the way there. Uh, there's more work to do, um, but uh, but um, I'll leave it at that. Um, so I've, I've spoken enough, um, and I'm happy enough time to take your questions. I understand I'll be uh, also talking with uh, Jeff Feltman and Bruce Rydell and Tammy. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary, and and my colleagues Jeff Feldman, Bruce Rydell, and Tamara Wittes are indeed online for a variety of reasons. We, we will have to channel their questions actually uh, virtually with apologies to everyone. Um, and I will start with one actually from, from Bruce Rydell um, regarding the, the rift in the Gulf. This has been a long time between the states. You spent, um, you had very high level meetings in, in Qatar. Can you tell us realistically what is about to change? The, the stance of a lot of the parties has not seemed to have moved a lot in the last two years. Um, is there really much to, to hope for? Is there a big change? Does it even matter that much? Well, there, thanks. It's a, it's a good question. Listen, there's a, been a, a, an awful lot of high-level engagement here in the United States, President, Secretary, um, a lot of White House involvement. Um, and uh, these are two sides that are, are dug in. These are longstanding and ideological issues here. Um, uh, and yet there's a recognition um, that this is a distraction from Iran and uh, the airspace issue is coming to a head because of course we all know um, uh, uh, Qatar has a, uh, has a suit pending uh, on, these, on these issues. Um, we are detecting, we've been working with, with our partners in the region, the GCC with, with, uh, with Qatar um, and uh, we're hoping that we see a little bit more flexibility here. I don't wanna get into the whole diplomacy in it but there, there is some movement um, I would like to say that it's going to be a matter of weeks, but once again, it's not only, uh, you know, the Saudis and the Emiratis and, and others that have complaints about Qatar. Qatar also has its own set of complaints about, um, about the others in the GCC. So we're, we're trying to work through it. There's not been a fundamental shift that makes this, you know, that we're going to push the door open right now, but, um, but in our talks, we're detecting a little bit more, more flexibility. So we're, we're hoping we can bring the sides closer together and end and, and this really distraction. Thank you. I, I'd like to follow up on some of your remarks. You mentioned a cascade of developments that you expect, not necessarily uh, new accords being signed immediately following the Abraham Accords. But I wonder if you could flesh out a little bit what this means. Did you have discussions in Kuwait on the possibility of normalization between Israel and Kuwait as well? Uh, do you expect Bahrain, Oman, or others that have been reported to follow suit? Um, and finally, there's, you know, concomitantly, you mentioned also the possibility of development between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Among most Palestinians, the accords have been received very negatively. Uh, is there a chance that they promote Israeli-Arab relations, but at the same time also hurt the possibility of Israeli-Palestinian relations that have been really in, in a worse shape than they've been for, for a couple of decades, perhaps? Um, thanks, Nathan. So um, I don't want to get into specifics about which states um, are, are uh, perhaps more uh, inclined uh, toward moving forward with either normalization agreements or um, or, uh, or uh, developing uh, already quiet ties or reestablishing new links to Israel. Um, you guys work at the think tank. You, you are more than capable of uh, speculating which states are <laughs> more able or more willing would be more willing to do so. Um, you know, Kuwait is, is not one of the states that is uh, leaning more toward that direction. There would be no secret. Um, as I said earlier, um, you know, these are sovereign states and they can, they can make up their, their own mind. Uh, the government um, uh, of the Emirates um, made the decision that it was in uh, their strategic interest and the people's strategic and economic interest to move forward and make already extant ties, um, quiet ties, overt, uh, and that there would be benefits for the people uh, that um, made it worth it, that they would no longer uh, be held hostage to the what uh, to the in the, the intransigent intransigence of the Palestinian leadership, um, and uh, this does not mean that any state or any people um, care less about the Palestinian cause, about the well-being of the Palestinian people. That is not doesn't remain an evocative issue, um, and yet um, 
I think it was, you know, highly symbolic that um, and important that um, that states are going to put their interests first um, beyond these sort of uh, causes. Um, you know, that said, um, I understand that the Palestinian uh, reaction has has not been entirely positive. Although there may be a, a shift in the a, a quieting of the language now um, uh, among the Palestinian leadership, um, and also a move to actually re-engage in some ways with the Israelis, um, whether that be on um, working out um, a way to move forward with, uh, re, uh, with uh, transfer of revenues again, um, something that uh, I think was cutting off the nose despite the face. Um, likewise, um, hopefully we can um, get the Palestinians to re-engage on security cooperation, something that serves both the Palestinians um, and the Israelis. Um, I don't know uh, whether, um, you know, whether there's something in the cards about uh, more direct negotiations, discussions of other issues rather than the day to day. Um, but um, I would hope, uh, you know, as time goes on, uh, that, I that the Palestinians will engage. Well, we've been uh, encouraging them to do so, whether with us or the Israelis or both. Um, and just don't think it serves their interests. It's no secret the Palestinians um, did not uh, very much appreciate uh, the president's vision uh, for peace. Um, uh, we're not saying they have to adopt it. We want them to engage in a, in a discussion. Um, the Palestinians have agency, and um, you know if they uh, if they engage, I think it'll be more productive for them. The one of the arguments that you hear from Palestinians and others about the Abraham Accords is that they uh, is getting ahead. Sorry, I'm, can you hear me properly? No, I can't. I, I'm I missed the Sorry, the, the, the question. Excuse me. Um, one of the criticisms you can hear is that the Abraham Accords circumvent the Arab Peace Initiative, a uh, normalization preceding resolution of the conflict. Um, could you give us a sense of the administration's position towards the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, partly as it relates to the Peace from Prosperity Plan, but just in and of itself, do you believe uh, the Gulf states or other states have simply moved by it as a thing of the past? No, I think that um, certainly there are, are um, some Arab states that still adhere to the to the uh, the Arab Peace Initiative. I don't think that's gone by the wayside. I think there are some states who still uh, hold that um, you know peace should come before uh, normalization. Um, and um, you know I that view is still out there in the region. Um, you know not all parties have, you know are signing up for for normalization with Israel yet. I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, and you know the Saudi Peace Initiative. You know the the was, uh, I think, and it remains a productive document. But I, I think, you know, Arab states saw the limitations. Some Arab states have seen the limitations in that document. Thank you. I have a question from Jeff Feldman, my colleague and your predecessor as Assistant Secretary. Uh, he thanks you, uh, David, for your comments. Perhaps more than anyone else participating today, I know the pressures that are on your shoulders, in particular with Lebanon. Jeff was ambassador there as well. Uh, thank you for your attention to Lebanon. What worries me is that the formula worked in 2005 to get the Syrians to leave, unified internal and external pressures, uh, leaving the Syrians with no choice but to withdraw their occupying forces, is absent today when an even more evolutionary change is needed inside Lebanon. Civil society activists seem to be divided, and the U.S. and France seem to have very different views regarding Hezbollah, with uh, the U.S. of course shunning it and, and uh, Lebanon and France partly engaging perhaps. Uh, did you detect in your Lebanon discussions more unity and focus among civil society activists be beyond the every, everyone means everyone must go slogan? Uh, and can you describe any international efforts to unify pressure on the Lebanese leaders to accept real change internally and regarding the indulgence of Hezbollah by Michel Aoun and uh, Gibran Basile and others? Well, there's a lot of questions and thanks, <laughs> thanks Jeff. Um, listen, um, <clears throat> what Camille Salibi said, you know, Lebanon's a house of many mansions and the, the Lebanese opposition is a house of many mansions as well. There's, I think uh, somebody put together a list and there's several hundred groups uh, that are out there with varying uh, degrees of uh, numbers of membership, et cetera. And yet we've, we've seen, you know, while um, there is uh, clearly a groundswell of, 
of support for change, for the uh, for their government embrace of reform, for anti-corruption, for transparency, for for accountability, for uh, this disassociation, for even now uh, more overt than ever, a call for um, a discussion, a real discussion about Hezbollah's weapons. Um, these opposition groups are still disparate, but um, for the first time, and I, I met with dozens of opposition people in, in, in my trip, um, for the first time, I, I, uh, I see a, a recognition among these groups that they have to, um, there has to be um, a, a more limited agenda on which they can unify. Um, and that there have to be actually political parties um, that emerge from this. Um, I heard I heard that uh, a lot, um, you know. But still, um, one of the other things that we're missing, Jeff, from uh, the difference between now and 2005 is that in 2005 we got a million and a half Lebanese. It's one out of every three Lebanese came to Beirut and said, "Get out." Uh, now you have 50% um, of the people in Lebanon are below the poverty line, right? 22% are destitute um, and are you know hungry. Um, you have COVID, right? Preventing people from, from gathering in groups. You have also had, um, um, and I, I don't recall the degree to which it occurred, but this built up Gia, this, um, these thugs that come out and beat up, whether they are from Hezbollah or, um, uh, you know, allegedly from, from Amal that come out and, and beat up protesters. So there's a whole, you don't have a um, sort of this big number, uh, critical mass uh, to generate that type of, of pressure either. And it's hard to say that what comes through is the chicken or the egg and whether you get international support because you bring the crowds or, um, but um, what I would say is that uh, I think that they are thinking in terms of, of the elections, they're thinking in terms of how they do political parties and how they have messages that are once again, limited, uh, non-divisive consensus building messages um, so you can have unity. Um, so I think that was important and that's something that uh, I've not seen a whole lot of over the years with, uh, with Lebanese opposition. Um, um, so about France, um, we have come out in support of the French proposal. I know that there are a lot of Lebanese, particularly in the opposition, um, who were not, um, you know, were not, um, were actually very concerned about, um, uh, about the trip and, and the agreement uh, that, uh, the initiative, the French initiative. Um, actually, I think that there's a lot of, of merit in, uh, in, the, in the initiative um, and uh, we're very supportive of it. Um, the fact that um, the President Macron has set a timeline, uh, the fact that, um, that the government has to meet certain criteria of being uh, you know, either technocratic or, or expert qualified, um, and that um, they actually do have to really implement reform until um, before as a pre prerequisite uh, for the release of international funding, whether that be the CEDRA on the, on the French side, or as we've agreed with the French, the, the, an IMF program from our side. Um, uh, and finally, and I think uh, most importantly, um, uh, the French have apparently um, warned that there will be sanctions and designations against Lebanese uh, pu public and political figures um, who, um, who obstruct the effort to form a government or uh, to implement reform. Um, and I think there's a message that we have not heard before from the French. Um, and I, I, I take President Macron as a man of his word. Um, and I'm, I am sure that he will, um, that the French will designate and sanction people, uh, Lebanese politicians who, um, who do obstruct reform and who do prevent um, this type of government from emerging. Um, we do have, um, you know, a, small difference on Hezbollah and how we see the organization. Um, we don't believe they are a quote unquote legitimate political party. Um, we do believe that you have to choose between bullets and ballots, um, that you cannot, political parties don't have militia to enforce their support or to threaten and intimidate uh, other politicians and political parties. Uh, this is not a level playing field uh, in Lebanon. One party has all the weapons. Right, um, you know, we are more of the mind of Germany and some other states that increasingly see Hezbollah as a problem, right? And we are encouraging France to to take a, a harder look at this. Can I 
press you a little bit on both on the very small difference between the American and the French position, uh, but also more broadly. So first on the, the small difference, Hezbollah has all the, the weapons and really is the most powerful force in Lebanon, I would say bar none. Um, isn't there a danger that by shunning them in a sense and their use of terrorism notwithstanding, um, the US is in a sense excluding itself from the real power brokers who unfortunately are often the ones with guns. Um, isn't it sort of leaving the stage to the French and perhaps that's a useful, useful tactic. Um, the second point uh, is on what sort of the aim of the US administration here? Is it reform or is it much more structural change to borrow a phrase from another arena? Uh, the, the demonstrations that we saw in Lebanon and some of the conversations you had, I think, regarded non-sectarianism, the possibility of getting past a system that is so beholden to the sectarian divides. Um, but of course, the reform that is being discussed now will likely fall well, well short of that. Should Lebanese listening today um, should they see the U.S. administration as supporting fundamental change to the Lebanese system or an attempt to climb out pragmatically but limitedly from the current crisis, which is extremely severe? Listen, um, we, we've talked, and I'm, I'm going to repeat myself here, but we've talked here at um, in State, um, at David Hale during his visit prior to mine, um, that we're focused you know, not so much on personalities as principles, Right. This is reform, 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 fight corruption, transparency, accountability, uh, disassociation. Um, I think that uh, that the if you can get a government that will chip away at this um, and make progress, uh, that necessarily will hurt Hezbollah. Right. This is not an organization that is inclined toward reform. This is an organization that does illicit finance that that smuggles goods across the border so that they can generate revenues, not for the state, but for their you know, separate, separate parochial political interest um, to fund their militia, et cetera, um, and pay patronage, play patronage politics. Um, so we do believe that reform, um, I think, will, um, will have an impact on, on Hezbollah um, as well as a beneficial impact for the country. We've heard, uh, I think President Aoun uh, even mentioned the idea of the civil state and changes that have to be made. Um, certainly I heard from um, the, the protesters and, uh, and uh, opposition groups, uh, individuals that I met, um, ideas about um, the transformative uh, change uh, in the political system. Um, certainly, you know, back in 1943, this was innovative and, um, you know, but it, um, it doesn't have that same type of dynamism today. I think that's what I heard from, from the people. Um, but this is for the Lebanese people to decide, right? We're, we're not making this thing, I think, uh, from a whole new cloth. I think we are trying to get substantial change. And mind you, once again, <laughs> reform, um, anti-corruption, transparency, accountability, disassociation, all those would be unprecedented for Lebanon, right? That would be transformative in a way, right? I mean, it wouldn't change the whole enchilada, but I think it would be um, substantial. Um, and I think that does constitute real change. Um, we have to continue to hold a high standard uh, of benchmarks for what actually constitutes reform, right? Um, we have a good understanding. I talk with my French counterpart, Christophe Farnot, um, every week, every 10 days, as well as my British counterpart, we have a, a good understanding. We are on the same page. We are coordinated um, and have been until now about what uh, reform means, what it looks like, um, and at what point in time uh, will we release funds, right? We don't want to uh, in any way um, support cosmetic reform, right? It can't be um, a couple few little things on, in the energy sector, for example, right? There has to be really broad and deep reform. And of course, um, we hold states like Jordan, our friends to these standards, right? Um, uh, when they did um, electric reform, electricity reform, they had to rationalize the cost of electricity. It was really hard and they went and made progress and made progress and then there were protests and they stopped and the money stopped, right? And then when they, they took their time, they got back on it refocused, made more reforms, 
and more you know bigger tranches of, of funding were released. I don't think you know I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be our approach to uh, to Lebanon as well. You made a uh, last point on Lebanon before I turn to the Gulf um, and a question from Tamara. You you made an interesting choice in Lebanon. You met with opposition and non-government officials. You did not meet with your government counterparts. I wonder if you can elaborate a bit more about that. That's not, uh, I imagine, the norm for an assistant secretary traveling to a foreign country. That's usually not what you do. Um, and if you could also speak a little bit about the new prime minister uh, in Lebanon and, and what kind of relationship you expect the State Department to have with him and his government. Thanks. Listen, I, uh, you know, my trip was my trip. I don't want to, you know, get into it. I, uh, I wanted to hear the views of the Lebanese people and creative views and and what people are doing to try and press their government. Um, you know, David Hale had been there um, just a, a week and a half or two weeks before I was there. Um, I am sure, and, I, and by the way, I talked to Lebanese officials on the phone periodically. Um, I, I, um, I plan on, on going back in the not so distant future. I'm sure I'll meet with, with political players, but um, you know, I, I really just wanted to to show our support for, for the people of Lebanon. What was the second part of the question? I'm blanking on it at the moment, but so I'll, I'll take it merely as a, as an accident, uh, Assistant Secretary happened to be in Lebanon and you didn't manage to schedule, you didn't have time to meet with the government. Excuse me, and my second part was of course with the new prime minister. What, oh yeah, what kind so, of relationship yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, Adib, once again, um, we followed um, the designation, we're following closely the, the formation of the government. Um, the French have laid out their expectations. We have seconded those expectations and made it clear where we stand. Once again, I don't, I'm not interested in the personalities, not on, right? We're interested in the principles, right? Whoever it is, right? Um, I can't say it enough. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you off the hook on that. Um, a question from my colleague Tamara Wittes uh, and returning a bit to the Gulf. Gulf states had high hopes for economic diversification of the private se and private sector growth. Uh, the effort seems stymied now, both by low energy prices that we're experiencing and falling even this morning, uh, and also in Saudi Arabia by pervasive weariness by the private sector abroad, especially because of the government's intense repression. Uh, what did you come away from for a trip in terms of Gulf states' plans for economic reform? I know you didn't visit the kingdom, but uh, but nonetheless, you deal with it, of course, often. And tomorrow also follows up and says that Saudi Arabia announced sentences this past week for individuals it says were responsible for murdering Jamal Khashoggi, uh, a U.S. resident, of course. But the trial was not open, and we've seen consistent reports of U.S. intelligence that the crown prince himself was directly involved in this crime. What exactly is the US government doing to continue to pursue justice and accountability for this murder? And a softball. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Tammy. Thanks a lot. Um, so on, um, on the Gulf, um, so the, the, there had been um, obviously an R uh, in train and a, a number of sort of ambitious programs. And the, the most ambitious of those was what Saudi 2030 um, that you know mapped out uh, the Saudi Saudification uh, of the workforce, uh, less dependence on um, uh, putting Saudis to work. Um, also diversification, right? Moving beyond oil, maybe the privatization of the parts of Aramco. Um, the these plans were out there. Other other states had them. Some actually, some other states have made you know already made progress on this. The Emirates had set out to do you know, financial sector and, and other types of things and high tech um, and had moved on this early and in Qatar, there's some move toward this as well. Um, in other states, um, there is you know, enormous degree of, uh, of public sector employment you know, in the 90% you know, range uh, or high 80s or whatnot that uh, with oil prices at $40 a barrel, I think not only does it make those states with a sort of enormously bloated, um, uh, you know, public sectors unsustainable, especially when you have, you know, the, the cradle to grave welfare system, uh, Medicare, health care, education, pensions, social safety net. Um, it makes it very difficult to sustain on $40 a barrel. I think we hear from the Gulf that the break even point is in the, in the $60 a barrel range. Um, so, 
uh, not only has this sort of, you know, changed or, or put pressure on the rentier system, but is also, um, I think, certainly the, the $40 a barrel combined with the, 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 the economic slowdown of COVID has really put the brakes on a lot of these diversification plans because they're, they cost money to do. Uh, if you don't get, you know, you're not able to retrain, put people to work, gather, et cetera. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of, uh, actually enormous amount of dislocation uh, in the Gulf. Uh, and um, I think some states are, are scrambling. And um, I think some of the states that rely on, on natural gas where the price volatility has not been you know, as severe um, are doing better. Um, and those that are uh, dependent on oil, it's been more of a, more of a challenge, no doubt. Um, and I think that's gonna, that's gonna persist because well, I mean, one wonders, um, you know, someday there will be an end to COVID hopefully um, you know, we'll get this, get our arms around it. Um, but whether, you know, the, our habits are, have changed or will change and whether, um, you know, whether we will get back up to 60 or a hundred dollars a barrel, uh, this, I don't know. Um, but these states have to be really thinking about, um, diversification and getting that moving again, uh, you know, strengthening their economies, um, so that they can contend with a, in a world where, you know, oil isn't 70 or hundred dollars a barrel in the future. Um, so that's on, um, on the energy. Um, so we've seen the reports of the final verdicts and sentencing, um, by the Arabian, Saudi Arabian court of eight people for the murder of Khashoggi. Uh, we've been closely following, uh, modern Saudi legal processes in the aftermath of, of the 2019 December. Uh, trial verdicts and uh, subsequent appeals, and we'll continue to, to do so. We call on Saudi authorities to ensure that all involved in Khashoggi's killings, uh, which King Salman labeled as a, as a, as a quote-unquote heinous crime, are, are held accountable. We continue to engage our, our Saudi partners to ensure that authorities complete a comprehensive investigation of Khashoggi's murder and hold those accountable, responsible, and to take actual structural steps to prevent such abuses from, from happening in the future. Um, we were all horrified by the, the murder of Khashoggi. Uh, the American people expect that the US-Saudi strategic partnership prioritizes a shared commitment to the rule of law and respect for human rights. Um, and as you know, the United States government has designated some 17 uh, different Saudis under different authorities for their role in the uh, Khashoggi affair. And uh, that's pretty much what I have to tell you on that. I get the feeling it's not the first time you've heard that question, but I'd like to press a bit more broadly on, on Tommy's very important point, which is there is a widespread perception that human rights, whether or not the rule of law and regarding American residents is one thing, but the general question of human rights or even democratization more broadly, it's clearly not the priority it was in the 2000s. That, that was, that's been true for many years now. But that human rights more broadly are a very low priority at best for this administration. Um, whether or not that's true, I think that is a very widespread perception. I wonder if you could address that at the macro level um, regarding specific countries in the Middle East, certainly, but, but more broadly uh, in, in all of your AOR. Are the, is that a priority? That yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a priority for me. And it's a priority for the secretary. I don't know if you've seen his podium remarks. He's commented several times on, um, on freedom of the press in Egypt about arrests of journalists. Um, he commented about the, the harassment of American citizens um, by, the, by the government of Egypt um, from the podium uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, he, uh, he talks about uh, wrongful arrest. I've given... Um, maybe more than a dozen interviews where I've talked about uh, the, uh, the right of Egyptians and, and other citizens of the Middle East, whether Lebanese, you know, elsewhere, uh, to demonstrate peacefully. Um, every time I engage with the Saudis, I raise the issues of Walid Fatehi and Lujain Hathul and, and others who have been um, imprisoned or uh, other issues. And the way I present it both to the Egyptians and to uh, our, our partners in Saudi Arabia 
um, is that, um, you know, the US government is dynamic, right? We, uh, we are a democracy and we have um, uh, periodically um, changes in power, right? The president will be here four or eight years and then we're gonna get another president, right? Um, what we're hearing right now in the House, right? Um, and you know, maybe the Senate could change over at some point. What you're hearing is a language in the NDAA that talks about Egypt and human rights and FMF. Um, and that, you know, it's quite possible someday you're gonna get you know, a Democrat majority in the, in the House and the Senate, right? What I wanna do in the case of, of Saudi Arabia is to cross off all the irritants in our bilateral relationship related to, to human rights. And there are some irritants out there, right? We have a very important and, and really strong strategic relationship. Um, and so we wanna work on things. And so we, you know, in my representations with them, we, we raise these issues routinely. Um, likewise with the Egyptians and other, other countries in the region. Yes, they are on the agenda. So I believe uh, that we're making the case every day. Thank you. Uh, that actually leads me to a final question from, from my colleagues and I'll turn to some questions from, uh, from elsewhere. But Bruce Rydell points us to one issue that hasn't been raised yet uh, relating to these possible irritants, uh, which is the, the war in Yemen. Uh, obviously a, a huge issue. Uh, the situation in Yemen does not get nearly enough coverage, uh, obviously for the enormous human catastrophe that we're seeing in a very poor country to begin with. Um, is there any hope for, for Yemenis? What is, what is the government's position on this? And particularly because the US government is involved not just as a partner of Saudi Arabia and others, but, but also in, in more real terms uh, in this conflict, what, what might we expect going forward uh, regarding Yemen and US policy towards it? Well, listen, I, uh, you know, it, it, it's not, um, I think it's a, your, your question you know, indicates that this is a, a uh, uh, I didn't hear it. I heard a lot, something about the Saudis in there I didn't hear anything about the Houthis or, or the Iranians in there, right? Uh, it takes two to tango. I know that the Saudis have, uh, over the past couple months, done two unilateral ceasefires, right? Um, that the Houthis didn't follow, right? Um, but I know that um, the Saudis are exerting enormous effort to try and negotiate a, a peace agreement with the, with the Houthis, with Yemen, um, they have, you know, they worked on the Riyadh agreement of the KBS did, I, I think, um, really put in enormous effort to try and bring the Southern Transitional Council and the uh, Republic of Yemen government of Hadi together um, after, you know, the split um, about, what, eight months ago um, to reunite them so that they could actually have a meaningful negotiation on the future government of Lebanon with the Houthi. Um, and the Houthi um, have not been, uh, you know, notwithstanding, I think, um, the really dedicated work of Martin Griffith on the ground and the UN um, and our, you know, diplomatic engagements, um, the Houthis have not been particularly productive partners in this negotiation. Uh, it, it seems as though they believe that they are on the verge of winning and taking Madhab and, um, and aren't interested uh, in the, um, in a goodwill negotiation about uh, having a unified Lebanon, uh, uh, Yemeni uh, government on um, which they would um, certainly play a significant role. So, um, you know, our assessment is that the Saudis want to end this war. Um, we are doing a, a, are a large humanitarian, I think second largest humanitarian contributor to Yemen. Um, where the situation, as you point out, um, you know, worse, made worse by COVID, but already, you know, has, it's a catastrophe of enormous proportion um, and you know, probably the largest humanitarian disaster, maybe, uh, I don't know, certainly in the region, if not the world, um, and a real tragedy. So we think they're, the Saudis are playing a, a productive role now and um, uh, are, intend to get a negotiated solution to this. Um, it's not my understanding that the Houthis are necessarily in the same place, uh, perhaps spurred on by their Iranian patrons. Um, and certainly the escal escalatory nature of where the Houthis are firing their missiles and one-way drones, um, on civilian centers, et cetera, 
um, is incredibly problematic and the level of um, indigenous um, ability to produce weapons is um, is going to be a problem for generations to come. A couple thank, of you, follow thank you to Iran. And so a couple of follow-ups actually regarding Iran. Um, the first is, what is your assessment of the degree that the Houthis might break with Iran, assuming that Iran is not looking to be productive in ending this uh, crisis? Um, and the second is, what's the degree of, of coherence or consensus among US partners? Are the Emiratis and the Saudis on the same page? Are others, what, what kind of differences do you find there? And what's the US approach to trying to, to bridge these differences if there is one? So I think it would be uh, not time. I mean, we are all um, like hoping that the Houthis are, um, will prove themselves to be Yemeni patriots and not a tool of Iran. Um, you know, the jury's still out on that. Um, but I think until now, they've not shown a great deal of independence um, in their decision-making process. Um, as for consensus, yeah, I think there is, you know, within the Gulf, a regional consensus that it's time for this war to wrap up, that the Yemeni people are, are suffering greatly. Um, and, you know, aid money is, is short, but, um, you know, the Saudis came up big last year, $500 million or something like that. Um, you know, big, big check. Um, and we're hoping to, you know, try and uh, work with the UN and our, our partners to, to generate that kind of, uh, that kind of funding this year from, from our Gulf partners. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to turn to a question that we received from the audience and I'll piggyback a bit on it. It's asking about great power competition uh, with China and Russia uh, and the future trajectory, I, you know, in, in a large span, a decade or so. Um, how do you expect this great power rivalry, which has obviously been a major focus of the administration, the Pentagon, but also other parts of the, of the administration. How do you expect that to affect the region going forward in the long term? And more immediately, you mentioned in your remarks, uh, the conversations you've had certainly with the Israelis, um, asking them to understand American concerns. Could you, but, but nonetheless, not to necessarily choose. Uh, that's a fine line, of course. Could you give us a bit more detail about what is it that America expects countries exactly to do? Obviously, economic interests uh, will remain with China. Uh, military concerns, of course, of the United States are clear. The, the boundary seems to be very difficult, certainly in technology and 5G and in infrastructure. Uh, could you flesh out a bit more also beyond Israel, where the front line of that conversation is? Yeah, so um, there's a, a great guy in, um, in state INR, a China scholar, um, who, uh, who talks about the difference between Russia and China um, in the Middle East. And he says that Russia is looking for relevance and China is looking for dominance. Um, so that's, um, that's from this guy in INR. He's is, um, actually from SP, actually. Um, great guy. Um, listen, I mean, both states um, have interests in the region. China gets all its energy, um, you know, vast majority of its energy from the region. Um, you know, Russia, I think, uh, and I've said this before, you know, I think it was a mistake to, you know, welcome them into, into Russia, into Syria, ex expecting that it would be a quagmire. I think it is, you know, embolden them. And, um, you know, now their involvement in places like Libya um, is, you know, extremely troubling. Um, and the prospect that you will have, you know, Russia set up shop on NATO's southern front um, is, is something that, um, you know, we're, we're not looking forward to and, and don't think it's in, you know, Libya's interest, um, and certainly not in Europe's interest and um, certainly not in our interest. Um, so um, China, on, on the other hand, you know, when we talk about China, you know, they have relations with a broad range of countries, trade relations, you know, they sell them weapons, they invest. Um, it's not, um, this is not without its perils because oftentimes we've seen places like Djibouti, even in Jordan, um, China does predatory lending, right? And then when you can't pay, they come and take an asset. Um, and so we like to inform our, our friends in the Gulf and, and elsewhere in the region about what the implication of this is. Um, but um, once again, to, to prevent um, China from you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're also, sorry, to, you know, warn our partners about what it means if you make a deal with Huawei, right? 
what it means for you know mill to mill cooperation between our country and you know X country in the region if our communications have to go over Huawei lines whether we can do that whether that information is secure whether you take a you know a, a, a Chinese COVID test whether your DNA winds up as property of the PRC right the Chinese Communist Party right you just got to be aware of that right this is not like like Google that can say that they're not going to open their cell phone for uh, for the U.S. government, right, and and have their day in court when the Chinese Communist Party says, you know, give us the information. You know, this is a this is part of the, this is the government gets the information, so there's a bigger threat here. So, what we talk about with and what we discuss with the Israelis is, you know, what kind of mechanism do you have? Whether it's the CFIUS or um, Export Control Act or uh, in the case of, of Israel, you know, you know their their system was they had they had a framework to, to dealing with these questions, but it was it wasn't sufficient. It wasn't mandatory, right, for for uh, business deals to go through these type of reviews. Um, and so we're you know we're talking to our partners about you know what type of deals constitute you know a threat, right. Um, uh, and uh, I don't think we're viewing this, you know, sort of overly, overly broadly. You know, I think we have sort of a, a, nar a narrow and, and um, interpretation of that. Do you expect in the long term, China, does it want to have military presence much more than it does today? Is it hoping to benefit from the region without burdening, without the burden of security? Security. There's there's a big debate among China scholars about many countries, many regions of the world. Certainly, the Middle East included. Is the base in Djibouti about piracy, or is it the beginning of much, much more? Um, and if it is much, much more, what's the U.S. position on it? I take it you do not think it's about piracy. Piracy? Do you think it's about piracy? No, I don't. Yeah, uh, listen, I think, um, you know, you can look at uh, what they've done. Um, I'm not a China expert, so I don't want to get out of my field here. But um, I think there's a, a, a trend that is in, in place. And the U.S. intends to counter it. Once again, that's, a, that's not my, my AOR. Well done. Uh, I can't hear you. I think you're, you're, they're muted. Sorry about that. One of the many hats you have to uh, bear is negotiating maritime boundaries on uh, gas fields. Again, going back to Lebanon. Uh, I know someone who has termed your office uh, sometimes assistant secretary for Lebanon. Um, what is the status of negotiations between Israel and the Lebanese government for demarcation of the, the EZ and the possibility of actually uh, drilling for energy there? Is it simply on back burner because of the extreme turmoil in Lebanon right now? Is there actually hope of, of moving forward? It, obviously revenue, if and when it came, which would be a while, could be quite helpful to Lebanon right now. Yeah, well, and this is why I, you know we were headed for a financial crisis in Lebanon for the past couple of years. You could see it, you know, this is a slow train coming. And, um, you know, for a state with, you know, 200% debt to GDP ratio, um, you know, with, you know, currency devaluations, all kinds of things that happened more recently, but certainly the debt ratio and whatever the central bank holdings were, um, you know, one would have thought that there would be a, a sense of urgency um, from the government of Lebanon to um, start to negotiate with Israel so that it could actually start to exploit what are probably going to be its three most profitable natural gas field blocks, eight, nine, and 10, that straddled the border. Um, for some inexplicable reason, um, there was no sense of urgency here. I mean, after all, we're, we're talking about free money, right? Um, for a state that is, you know, in a financial crisis. Um, so there was no sense of urgency. And um, this was delayed. I think David, uh, Ambassador Satterfield worked on this for a year and, um, you know, basically um, got to almost where we are at today. And in the course of a year, we've made a tiny bit more progress and we still don't have an agreement. Now I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping we can get there in the coming weeks. Um, 
but it remains to be seen, right? Um, it's actually, you know, I'm not going to tell you what the sticking point is, but it's really, uh, um, when it's all done, I'll, I'll have to tell everybody uh, it's, 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 it's absurd. So, um, so anyway, hopefully we can, we can get there. Um, but, uh, and hopefully Lebanon in its spirit of reform will pass a uh, sovereign wealth fund law so that uh, this does not go to corruption and that the state benefits. Um, but yeah, I don't see, you know, this is, we're only talking about once again, a framework agreement here for negotiations. They still have to have the negotiations. So we're, we're not even there yet. So the sticking point is minute or, or laughable or will be when we hear about it. Um, it's usually political will, therefore, that simply doesn't want to make that extra little step. Is, is the problem, I take it, on the Lebanese side? Are the Israelis been eager? They, most of their fines are, are already being developed, uh, at least the fines so far. Uh, have you seen sort of an Israeli forthcoming approach to this and Lebanese internal dynamics? Is that a fair description? You know, I'm not gonna. I'm not ready to uh, to play the ba- the blame game yet. I can try. Yeah. No, I'm not gonna. Um, you you mentioned earlier the question of uh, Libya in the context of uh, Russia. Uh, Libya, of course, another huge issue, um, very troubling one, and again uh, in your portfolio. Uh, there's not only a Russian aspect there, there's a Turkish one as well. We've received several questions regarding uh, Turkish involvement in Libya. And really Libya has been a, almost a proxy, a case of so many different uh, countries, including ones very far away, all the way from the Gulf being involved. But to be honest, most people we, we talk to simply address Libya as almost this hopeless case. But of course, Libya is a country. You cannot, you cannot simply throw your hands up on a country and a population. What, what is the current U.S. hope for practical progress? Uh, uh, what are your parameters for all countries involved, including some who are partners of the United States, but not always on the same side? Well, listen, um, Libya is complicated, as you know, right? It's not, uh, you know, you have the Syrianization, as it were, of um of Libya. So you have the Turks standing off against the Russians there. Um, then, of course, you have the Wagner uh, group, the Russian mercenaries who are there on the ground. Then, of course, you have the Emirates. Uh, then you have the Egyptians. Um, then you, you know, at one point you had the French. Um, you, um, there are rumors of, of Qatari involvement in some form. Um, this is the sort of regional overlay um, of the of the Gulf Rift and, and Muslim Brotherhood, et cetera. Um, uh, we have engaged, um, actually, the Secretary spent a great deal of time on it. I spent a great deal of time on it constantly um, talking to my counterparts, British and French, about this. We, uh, we participate in the Berlin process. It's our view that this cannot be solved militarily. Um, there has been an escalation, but we do see that we are at an inflection point of sorts with uh, de facto uh, ceasefire line, as it were, around Sirte Jufra, um, and that we can um, use this as an opportunity to actually draw both sides into negotiations. And we had, you know, youthful announcements of ceasefires, et cetera, that we'd like to consolidate. And so, you know, the UN process is in place. Um, we have also worked uh, with our partners and are moving ahead with an attempt to sort of reform, um, as we tried to do with, with UNIFIL in a way, to reform the, the UN approach to this, because we don't think that the, the, the special representative of uh, the Secretary General, who is Hassan Salaman, who did a great job, um, that he basically has two jobs, right? As a special representative, um, that he was on the ground um, in uh, Libya managing these humanitarian UN projects and a staff of some 350 people, right? And at the same time, he was expected to run negotiations to, you know, with all the major regional partners to come to a, a negotiated solution. And we just saw that as too many, too much work for one person. And uh, so we pressed forward and, and uh, like we're, we're going to get a, a special envoy to handle the negotiations in addition to the special representative on the ground uh, in Libya managing uh, these, these projects. Um, we think that'll be helpful, but it's been tough going. It's no, it's no secret. Um, you know, in Berlin, um, uh, 
we came to an agreement about how we we're going to approach this. The, the, I talk routinely to Jan Hacker, the German National Security Advisor, about this. Um, you know, there is no, you know, no lack of attention to the issue. Um, but uh, many of the actors, as you know, are, are quite stubborn. Um, but, um, you know, we have, um, I don't know if you've met Dick Norland, who's just an outstanding ambassador who's, you know, running the show for us out in, uh, and, you know, he and Josh Harris, our, our DCM, have been on the ground in Libya several times and in recent months and, you know, are continuing to visit. So, um, you know, more diplomacy, more efforts from our European partners and uh, more arm twisting to, you know, get the, the GNA and the LNA to actually engage productively. Um, we're seeing the, the I think, the, the kernels of that right now. Um, you know, it's hard to be optimistic about it, but we are pressing forward and trying to consolidate um, small gains on the ground. Well, before we have about six minutes left, I want to make sure I circle back to two issues that have come up a lot. Um, one uh, regarding Iran, which we have actually not discussed at length, and of course the Secretary has spent an enormous amount of time on that, including very recently. Um, there seems to be sort of, I don't know if it's an irony, but a contradiction. The U.S. approach has garnered a lot of support from many of the regional partners, certainly in the Gulf and among the Israelis, there's a lot of satisfaction with the U.S. approach of maximum pressure, as the President and the Secretary have put it. Um, but at the same time, we see in the U.N. Security Council and some of the partners, uh, the erstwhile partners of the United States on the Iranian issue, uh, we saw very recently uh, great difficulty uh, garnish, garnering the same kind of support uh, for snapback san sanctions and other issues. Um, where do you see this going? You see maximum pressure remaining a U.S. Uh, approach together with the Gulf and the Israelis. Do you see much hope of getting support from the Europeans or the Russians or the Chinese? But let's start with the, the British or, or, or the two, two EU members, not even them. Uh, where is that going? Well, thanks, not, Tom. As you know, um, you know, our lead on this right now is Elliot Abrams. Um, since the departure of uh, Brian Hook, I, I can say that we were um, disappointed um, that we failed to get support for extending the, the arms embargo. Uh, it's unconscionable, actually, looking about what Iran is doing right now in terms of uh, exporting uh, arms to its regional proxies, whether that be uh, the Iranian-backed Shia militia in Iraq, whether it be the Houthis, whether it be the Fatimun or Hezbollah in, in Syria and Lebanon, um, it was incredibly destabilizing. And they are already under <laughs> an arms embargo. Um, one can only imagine what it looks like after. And so, um, you know, we, of course, will go after countries economically that, that do business with, with um, sell arms to, to Iran. But um, we are moving ahead with snapback, as you know. I think it's what, on the 21st. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know what that's going to look like. Once again, Elliot Abrams is the guy to talk to about that. But, um, you know, um, you know, there was a time, I would say, that even if, um, you know, we're talking to our, our partners and uh, looking for support on this, um, but the United States is a powerful economic machine and companies are not going to want to get secondary sanctions. Uh, regardless of whether their own governments adhere to snapback. Thank you. I guess we have time for really one last question, so I'll end where you started, which is the UA-Israeli Accord. Of course, the flip side of that uh, has been um, the removal or the suspension of Israeli plans to annex parts of the West Bank. There's been a lot of different versions. We've heard many different versions of what exactly that entails. Uh, with some claiming this will be a long time, some of, of suspension of this idea, some saying it might only be a short um, tabling of the idea. Uh, where does that stand? What is your understanding of the Israeli commitment on annexation? Uh, of course, I know the White House is heavily involved in this, but uh, nonetheless, as representative of the US government, and you've commented on this, um, is this another case of the F-35s where the two sides have very different versions and we sort of have to guess among them what is reality? What where do you understand annexation to be? Well, I, you know, I saw the language like you've, like you've seen, and um, this obviously was sufficient for the Emiratis. Um, 
But we've seen, you know, by the way, in the past, you've, you've had normalization that has been reversed historically, right, based on diff different conditions, um, whether that's uh, uh, the, the trade offices in Qatar in the 90s that somehow disappeared over time. Um, so I think the, the Israelis are well aware um, of the sensitivities in the region um, and, um, and are also aware um, you know, the, that um, of um, the fact that um, uh, they, have, they must have different calculations based on, um, based on politics uh, in the region and in the United States. So would it be fair to say that you'd expect if annexation came back and was implemented, that normalization with the UAE might no, go I, away? I'm no, I'm not commenting on that. I know I said that there's, there's sensitivities in the region. Um, I think the Israelis will, you know, have to make their, their own decisions. I think that they have been pretty savvy in the, how they've dealt with their, their Arab partners in, in the Gulf uh, and in working to build relationships. And I think they're going to be protective of those relationships. Well, Assistant Secretary Schenker, uh, your time is valuable and we don't want to take any more of it. So I want to thank you very much on behalf of uh, Brookings and my colleagues at the Center for Middle East Policy, including Suzanne Maloney, who's now also our Vice President. Um, and a thank you to everyone who's joined us, both in the United States, uh, in the region and elsewhere. Uh, we hope you will tune in, uh, continue to tune in uh, to our work here on the same website. Sec Assistant Secretary Schenker, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure uh, to have you here, even in official position. And, and we're sure to have you for many years uh, to come in official or, or, or otherwise. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, Brookings. It's good to see you. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.